We want to welcome all of you here tonight to share with us at Cannon Baptist Church as we go to God's Word and, and see what the, what the Lord will tell us tonight and share with us. Um, our scripture passage is found in Philippians chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 7 and going through verse 11. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am Steve Ferguson, the Associational Mission Strategist for the Hebron Baptist Association. And uh, it is my privilege to be here and to share uh, with these fine folks and with you who are watching this. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things we have difficulty with is, is facing things that we don't know anything about. Uh, facing life when we don't know what's ahead. And, and we, we kind of struggle with that. And so I, I want us to to look at this passage of scripture uh, with that idea in mind of, of how do we how do we face the things that are that are unknown to us uh, and so let me read Philippians chapter 3 beginning with verse 7 and going to verse 11 and I will be reading uh, from the Christian Standard Bible but everything that was gained to me I have considered to be lost because of Christ now we've got to look look before that and see what he's talking about and he's talking about how he had grown up or how he had uh, experienced life uh, in the in the in the world of Judaism and uh, all of the things that had happened to him and and how he had um, he had confidence in the flesh he had been uh, of one of the tribes uh, he was born a Hebrew he he loved the law and he tried to follow the law uh, he was very zealous. Uh, he even persecuted the church. But he, then he says, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered it to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as done so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Now, our focus tonight is on verse 10. Verse 10 says, Paul says, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What does that mean to us? Uh, what does it mean to do that? I, I want to start off with a story about my middle son. My middle son had some difficulties of, of learning and uh, we had to work with him and one of, the, one of the goals that I had for my children was that they would go to college. And uh, we, we have five children, and, and our blessing is that all five of them went to college. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, that I don't appreciate people who have not gone to college. That was just something that my, my dad, my parents instilled in me. And, uh, and, and so uh, that was something that I st instilled in my children. And and, uh, and he struggled while he was in college. In fact, before he went, my wife said, you know, you might ought to re reconsider this with him. Uh, because he has, uh, he either had ADD or ADHD. Uh, he had some learning disabilities, but uh, we still maintained that. And he went through college. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult for him, but, but he did make it all the way through college in horticulture. Now, when you have those struggles like he had, it's horticulture might be one of the, the degree programs you'd stay away from because in horticulture, you got to know not only the names of the plants, you've got to know the, uh, the Latin and, and all of these other names and, and, and characteristics of the plants, but he made it through there by the grace of God. And when he finished that, he, he uh, began to be on the grounds crew at, at uh one university and then he went to another university he was on the grounds crew there and he told his mother one day he said you know i didn't have to go to college to do what i'm doing 
And, uh, and but, but see, one of the things that we, we don't know is we don't know what's out in the future. And he didn't know what was out in the future. And so I want you to hold that thought about him because I want to talk about this passage of Scripture. And, and then I'm going to get back to the story. So in this passage of Scripture, we need to look at ourselves and what needs to happen in our lives. How do we face the things that are in the world? Have you ever made this statement that I don't see how people without Jesus are able to face difficulties of life? Probably all of us have said that at one time or another. And, and we wonder. But I'm not sure that, that we are, are, are really reaching the goal that we need to reach to understand how to do that and what God's really doing. Because sometimes we look at life as a section in time rather than the whole story. Because our, our life of faith is a whole story, not just a section of time. It's not just one little experience through some circumstances that we face. It's what God is doing in our lives because he wants us to be his witnesses. And there are things that occur in our lives for us to be his witnesses. And so when, when we don't understand the world and what's going to happen with the world, what do we do? Well, Paul gives us the directions right here in this, in this verse 10. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to immerse our life in Christ. The one thing that separates Christianity from every other religion, and I don't like to call Christianity a religion, but many people do. But one of the things that separates Christianity, in fact, the one thing is Christianity is about relationship. It's not about following rules and regulations, because how are we going to be saved? We are saved through a relationship. Not by what we do. How do we get to heaven? I asked a man that question one time. I said, if you were to stand before God today and he would ask you this question, what would you do? And that question is, or what would you say? And the question is, how, why should I let you into my heaven? And that man said, because I'm a good person. What makes a person good? Well, we look at people who are worse than we are. But we don't get to heaven on what we do. We get to heaven on our relationship according to the scripture. And so that I may know him is a relationship term. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, talks about us being focused on Jesus. The message says in, in the the, the uh, the, the scripture, the message, it says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And so as we know Christ, then we are able to face the things that are unknown to us. But how are we going to know this? There's a story in John chapter 4 about the woman at the well. And Jesus met the woman at the well. He talks with her. Uh, his disciples had gone into town to the, to the, to the, to the local Chick-fil-A to, to bring back lunch. And so he's, he's talking with this woman. And uh, she's from the town. She's drawing water. And, and he had a great conversation with her. I'm not going to go into everything. But she went back to town and she began to tell her neighbors and friends about this man that she met out at the well. And so she takes this crowd of people out to see Jesus. And, and Jesus talks with them and shares with them. And then Jesus stays in that area for a while and they, they get to know him. And in verse 42 of John chapter 4, it says, And they told the woman... We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. It was by their experience. It was, it was the relationship. 
They, they believed in what she said, but they really understood and believed because of their experience with Christ. We have knowledge about Jesus because of teachers and the Bible and because of some experience that, that we have. But Paul was, was speaking of the knowledge of Christ by experience. That's more than just believing things about Jesus. Satan believes that things about Jesus, but he doesn't have a relationship with him. Because a relationship with him means so much more. It's gained through the experience of companionship and communion with Christ, of walking with him daily. It's, it's an experience of receiving as well as giving. Many times in relationships, we just want to, we just want to receive. We don't, we don't want to give. But with, with Christ, it's a re relationship of receiving as well as, as giving. And so such knowledge, such intimacy of knowledge cannot be learned by reading words of the page. It's the knowledge of love. How do you, how do you, how do you have love? Just by reading words? Or is it by getting to know someone and caring for someone? A friend of mine's a, a pastor, and he's on up in his 80s, and, and uh, he's, he's, he's a, an interim or a transitional pastor. And he and I talk a, a couple of times a week, and, and uh, w one of the things we do is we tell each other that we love, uh, that we love each other. And, and he, he asked me one day, he said, have you ever noticed that sometimes when you tell a preacher that you love him, their response is, me too? And I said, yeah. He said, I don't want to be one of those. I said, I don't either. And so we, got, we have this going thing of uh, sometimes when we end our discussion on the phone, we just say, me too. <laughs> now, we know what that means because we have that discussion. But when you're talking about inter, uh, love, it's, it's, it's intimate personal communion. It's knowing Christ's heart and his will. How are we going to know Christ's heart and his will? We know him because of our experiences with him. We know him because of spending time in his word daily. We know that because of our prayer time with him as we talk to him and he speaks to us and he gives us encouragement. And so we're growing in that relationship as we know him. The apostle Paul did know Christ. He knew in whom he had believed. He knew Jesus for himself, not because of what others had done, but because of his experience with Christ. He knew that he had spent three years with him, learning and, and meeting and talking with him and sharing with him. And he learned all many things about life. Uh, he, he knew his, that, that Jesus had a personal interest in him. There, there are individuals that I've talked with through time. And one of the questions I'll ask you is, is, who, is who is the father or who is the, the son to you? And these are people who, who are part of a congregation somewhere. I'll say, who, who is Jesus or who is, his, who is God to you? Well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, 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 is the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, is that Someone who is way off out there somewhere, or is it someone who's right here? And I'll never, I'll never forget the first time I asked a lady that. And she said, well, I, I guess he's some, somebody way out there. I'm glad she was honest. And I said, then I understand what your difficulty is. Because she had come to me about some difficulties in her life. And I said, I understand what your difficulty is. Because the first thing that needs to happen in your life is you need to know Jesus as somebody who's right here. And that comes through having that personal relationship. His knowledge of Christ, Paul's knowledge of Christ was very great, but it was imperfect. He knew, but it was just in part. He didn't know all about Christ. He desired to know more of Christ, of the mysteries and glories of the person uh, of the unsearchable riches of his grace, of his great salvation, the benefits of it, of his love, which passes perfect knowledge, and to have a renewed and enlarged experience of communion with him. And that's the desire that all of us need to have, is to know Christ in that way, to know the Father in that way.
Because that's, that's why the Father sent the Son into the world, that we can have a relationship with the Father. Because he's going to help us. Most of us become anxious about something. And at one of the verses that God has spoke to me about a number of years ago, and, and, and I know Debbie's sitting right here on the front row, and so uh, I, I'm going to quote that verse. Uh, or or the, those two verses the way Debbie said it to me one time. Be anxious for no thing. That's right. I remember that. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your heart, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. What was, what's, what's he saying there? What's, what's Paul telling the, the folks at, at, in, in Philippi? He says, listen, we don't have to be anxious about things. When we become anxious about things, what we need to do is put them in the hands of the Father and don't take them back. And when you put them in the hands of the Father by faith, you're saying, God, I know you're going to take care of this. Now, God might take care of it the same way you do, but most of the time it's not the same way that you do. But we have to trust him. So Paul says the first thing that we need to know is we need to know him. We need to immerse ourselves in him. The second thing he says is we need to experience the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. Paul wants to experience the same power which raised Christ from the dead surging through his own being, overcoming sin in his life, and producing the Christian graces. The resurrection power of Jesus is a spiritual power. It liberated Christ from the effect of sin. It freed Christ from the bonds of death. It allowed Christ to walk out of the grave. Wow! Can you imagine that? That's something that we kind of look forward to, don't we? When we understand that Jesus is coming back and he's going to gather his church, wow. We, we want to be a part of that. We want to see that. And that will be a part of our lives as, well, as long as we know him, as long as we're in a relationship with him. I've experienced the regenerating power, and I will experience the resurrecting power. The regenerating power is I surrendered my life to Christ years ago in, in Athens. And I was sitting at, at the home that I was living in. I was reading the Bible because I knew that's what Christians were supposed to do, but I wasn't a Christian. I thought I was a Christian. And that night, God spoke to my heart. And I surrendered my life to him, to his lordship. And he changed my life. My life was different. And the only way you can explain that difference is because of what he did in my life. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't do anything to change it, but my life was different. The woman that I've been married to for about 45 years can tell you about that because I dated her and, and I, I went off somewhere for, for a summer job and when I left, she told her best friend she'd never date me again. But she did. And the reason was she said, I was different, but it wasn't anything that I did. It was what God did inside of me, how he changed my life. He delivered me from the penalty of sin. I still have difficulty with the weight of sin in my life, but this power provides me the ability to receive God's grace and to say no to the sin. The power of sin no longer has rule over me because of what the Father has done in my life. And I look forward to the day when I will no longer be in the presence of sin because that power will, will deliver me to my home in heaven that I'm sure of. I've met a lot of people over time who say, well, you can't be sure that you're going to heaven. Yes, you can. The Bible says you can. In 1 John, it says, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And so we can know we have eternal life because it's that relationship. And so now I experience the power of grace. Some people say that the definition of grace, and I don't have a problem with this, 
that the definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. And I believe that's true. But from what I've seen, grace is so much more than that. God's grace is so much more. Because we, we tend to think of God's merit, unmerited favor at the time of salvation. But what about after salvation? And our walk with the Father. What about that grace? And so someone defined that grace as this. And it's, it's the same grace. But grace is the desire and the power to do what God asks and says for us to do. God himself gives us the desire and the power to do his will. We just have to surrender to him. And so he not only gives us the desire, but he gives us the power to be overcomers of sin and yes to obedience. He gives us the power to forgive. He gives us the power to love as we should. And so we need to experience the power of an overcoming life. And that comes from our surrender to the Father and him working in us. As we tell him, I want to love people. You know what happens when you begin to say, I'm going to love, I want to love people like Jesus loves? Somebody comes along in your life and just upsets the apple cart, don't they? Just irritates you no end. And you just have a hard time. But God said, well, if you want to love like Jesus, how was it that Jesus loved? Who did he go to the cross for? He went to the cross for that guy who nailed the nails. He went to the cross for that guy who, who, who used that kind of nine tails and whipped him until he bled profusely. He went to the cross for King Pilate if Pilate would have given his life to Jesus. He still went to the cross for him. And he went to the cross for me. And so we need to experience the power of an overcoming life. And then the third is the fellowship of his suffering. Wait a minute, preacher, you've gone too far. We don't want to suffer, right? Isn't that what we say? We don't want to suffer. And yet this passage says the fellowship of his suffering. We need to learn to join Christ in his suffering. If you're going to know Christ, we cannot separate the fellowship of his suffering out of all that. Suffering was a major aspect of his life. How many times did he weep? How many times did he struggle? What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was led away to the cross? But we don't want to suffer. In the kingdom of God, suffering is synonymous with obedience. It's easy to be obedient when it costs us nothing. When faced with the aspect of suffering, we prefer not to be obedient. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, though he was God's son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. As the divine son of God, Jesus did not have to suffer. But as the son of man, suffering was required to learn obedience. The Greek word used in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 for suffered usually refers to enduring unpleasant experiences like disease or persecution. But it often also implies enduring a challenging process that transforms the sufferer. Go through scripture and look at those who suffered. Look at a guy named Joseph. At the end of the book of Genesis, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. Who was sold on the market to a man. Who was lied about by that man's wife and thrown in prison. And had to stay in prison. Look at a guy named David. Who was called out from the sheep pasture. Tending the sheep. To be anointed by Samuel. To one day be king. But look at all of the things that he suffered at the hands of a king named Saul. Look at the suffering that Moses faced 
as he was ridiculed by those that he was seeking to lead to a promised land. So it's a process that transforms the suffering. And I've learned that in my life, I should desire it. If you, want to, if you want to get a picture of it, look at the potter and the clay. How does the, the potter mold that clay into a beautiful vessel? The only way to do it is putting pressure on it. What's pressure? That's suffering. So how many of us welcome suffering? But we should because that means God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us like we are. He wants us to be different. And what does that di difference look like? Look like it looks like Jesus. So in the sense in which the word is used in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, Jesus chose to endure an unpleasant, challenging process because it was the will of his father for his brief time on earth. And we should welcome that ourselves. I know people think you're nuts when you say things like that. But that's a part of following Jesus. When we suffer as Christ, we are obedient. Christ had to suffer to carry out God's will. And God's will for us is suffering. When we see the sinfulness of God's people and the world, we struggle emotionally. As the world persecutes those who follow Christ, we struggle but remember the, the, those in the book of Acts, the followers of Christ, who rejoiced over the fact that they suffered for Jesus. They rejoiced over the fact that they got to suffer. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of things against you for my sake. He says, great is your reward in heaven. And then the fourth one, being made conformable to his death. Wow, that's another hard one. There's, a, there's another, another difficult one. But it's a part of surrendering to God's amazing work in your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this, now we have this treasure in clay jars. What's the treasure? The treasure is Jesus. We have this treasure in clay jars. In other words, a lump of clay. So that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are pressured in every way, but not crushed we are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What is Jesus doing in our lives? Let's put it in the words of a hymn. Let others See Jesus in you. That's why the Lord's at work in your life in this way. That's why the, this passage of Scripture speaks in the way it, it, it speaks. We, surrender, we surrender to God's amazing work in our life to die to self. Because if self is still alive, God can't work in our lives. And that's why we have to surrender to him. That's why Jesus said, if any man will come after me, in Luke 9, 23, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, excuse me, verses 1 and 2, he says that we are to present our, body, our bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable worship. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. It goes
goes on in that second Corinthians passage that says, for we who live are always given over to death because of Jesus, so that Jesus' life may also be revealed in our mortal flesh. A great passage of scripture for us to understand because we do in life, we become perplexed when we have things that are happening to us. One of the things we will do is we'll cry out to God and say, Lord, why? Why is this happening? Why is this struggle occurring? But here it tells us why. Because of God's great love for us. God is molding us and making us so that we will look like Jesus to the world. We won't, we won't be exactly like Jesus, but parts of our lives will look like Jesus as we surrender to him. I told you about my son and the struggles that he had, his learning disabilities. And he, has, he had difficulty, probably the most difficulty of any of our children in, in making through college. He went to, uh, I mentioned about him, him working on on uh, these uh, these plant teams and and uh, uh, yard teams of, of different schools, but then he he got a job with another company where he was doing tree work. Then he got a, a job with another company where he was doing plant health work and and plus tree work. And then the co that company that he was working for was bought out by another company. And that company only did tree work and they wanted to, ha to, to have a plant health part to every location that they had in the southeast. But they needed somebody to do that. And so the person that they chose to do that was my middle son. And so he had the responsibility because that, he was named director of plant health services for this company. And he had to buy all of the equipment for this location and, and for these different locations. And, and he had to hire people in each of those locations. So he had, to, he had to drive there and be there. Or he had to fly there because one of the locations that they had was in New York, New York State. And then he had to fly there. And he had to train all these people. And because of the work that he did, he receives a commission for this. And he's all excited about what's happening in his life. And I said, son, let me share a couple of things with you. Because you're so young, I said, they couldn't name you vice president. They had to name you director. I said, because if you were older, you would have been named the vice president. But I said, also, the reason that you got this position are two reasons. One was because of God's grace. The other was because of the struggles that you had in college. They saw something in you because of what occurred in your life and how you struggled through college and you learned and, and, and you, ha you have all of this knowledge and, and, and you're, you're continuing to learn and you're, you're learning how to deal with people and work with people and because of all those things. You see, God had something else planned for you to do, to be a witness and a testimony for him in a different way and to influence more people than you ever have in your life. But he hadn't seen that. He had seen the different segments of his life, but he hadn't put it together that here was God's story through him. And we need to understand that for all of us, God is at work building a story. We call it a testimony. But it's a continuous work in our lives as God seeks to draw us to himself, as he works in our lives to make us more like Christ. And at each step, we begin to influence other people. That's why he places those pe us with those people. Now, I know how people are. I know how, how you think sometimes because I do too. Well, you know, life would be a whole lot more easy if it weren't for people. Right? And yet those are the same people that Jesus died for. And those are the same people that we need to be sharing with and being light in a world of darkness because their world is dark 
and we need to be reaching them for Christ. In the Christian Standard Bible, you heard me say in this in verse ten, "My goal is." Now, in in translate in other translations, that's not there. My goal is is not there. It may not be in the translation that you have. It may not say my goal is. But when you read that the content of that and, and the context of that passage, it's Paul is saying, "Here's what my goal is." He said, "I haven't reached it." I haven't attained it, but my goal is. It was not just to help him through difficult times. Here was a life goal for him that he would be more like Christ. And I can tell you this from personal testimony. That, that this verse has helped me for over 40 years. In fact, I would say for probably about 43 years. Because 43 years ago, sitting in a seminary class, I heard a professor say, or ask this question, how many of you have a life verse? And I didn't have a life verse. I didn't know what a life verse was. And a life verse is a verse of scripture that God gives you. And so I began to ask God to give me a life verse. And God gave me Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And through these 43 years of, of walking with the Lord, or actually it's, it's a lot more than that, but through these years of walking with the Lord, many times I've gone back to this verse of here is what God is doing in my life. Here's how God is molding me, this lump of clay. He's molding me into what he desires for me to be so I can live as Christ. And that's what he's doing in all of us who are followers of Jesus. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Father, how grateful we are to you to understand some more about your desire for our lives. And Lord, in our lives we have joys and sorrows and we have triumphs and struggles. But your desire is for us to look to you. Because you're the author and the finisher of our faith. You saved us, not just for heaven. You gave us salvation. You, you drew us to yourself. You provided salvation through the blood of Jesus. So that we can be your witnesses in this world. And so, Father, I pray for all followers, just as Jesus did in that prayer in John chapter 17. Father, I pray that we would be one with you of seeking to know you and doing your will. Dear Father, I pray for my friends, for my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would be faithful to you, that we would experience life as you desire even through the struggles who, that, that accomplish your, it accomplishes your work in a great way. Thank you, Father, for that. Even though we don't want to say thank you sometimes, Father, we're grateful to you for it. So that this world may know that there's a God in heaven who cares for them in the same way that you care for us. And will surrender lives, their lives, to you. We pray this prayer in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.